that was like the double hit of he's profiling not only Mexicans, but he's profiling my actual Yaqui tribe. And that, and that was big, that was huge. That was the first time, one of the, one of the few times that I realized in this relationship that it's a thing. Today we are uh, having uncomfortable conversations about being a biracial couple. I'm white, I'm Caucasian, and uh, supposedly a little bit of blood mixed in there of indigenousness, mainly this. And I am both indigenous and Latinx. Specifically, my family is Yaqui from the Sonoran area of Mexico and Arizona, and from Mexico on the other sides of my family. We have actually, I am, I am not a first generation, I am not an immigrant, but I have this heritage that is very important to my family and to more and more important to me. <laughs> how, how has race played into our previous relationships? For myself, I've only had a couple of long-term relationships and none of them as long as this one and they've always been with white people. I just haven't connected with indigenous or Latinx people or black or Asian people to have relationships. In the past, I have dated, uh, I had a relationship with a, uh, with a black woman, an African American, and it was really my first dive into, into black culture. And they were from Queens, New York. And it, it really opened my, eyes to, it opened my eyes to the beginnings of, of my own white fragility and my own prejudice and uh, how I was raised. The beliefs that I didn't know I had that had sunk so deep into my bones that they still come out once in a while in, in this relationship. We've hashed a lot of stuff out. It is incredible how deeply that programming gets into your, into the essence of, of a person's being. But you had done a lot of that work with that previous relationship, so it's not like you walked into this relationship with as much prejudice and bigotry as you may have had in the past. True. And you've definitely made progress, just as I've made progress, dealing with my own internalized things in the long time we've been together. We need to talk about what I consider to be the elephant in the room, which is that I have an incredible amount of passing privilege. A lot of people look at us and don't see an interracial couple. They don't recognize my Latinx, they don't recognize the indigenous in me. There are other people who see it instantly. For a lot of my life, I have had a tremendous amount of privilege on the outside. That doesn't mean that on the inside I wasn't dealing with fears of being profiled or fears of being discriminated against, because I did. In my family, my dad and my sister have darker skin than I do. My mom and my brother have lighter skin than I do. So I was like right in the middle and I could see how they each got slightly different treatment as I was growing up. We lived in a community that was predominantly white and because we were light enough skinned, they basic, mostly accepted us. And we didn't encounter too many incident, incidents of that. It wasn't until college and later that I could tell when people clocked me and when they didn't, if I was paying attention. Right, right. there's that whole paying attention there's thing. There's the whole paying attention thing because I do have social anxiety and there's probably some neurodivergence going on that I'm not necessarily aware of what's going on around me, especially in public situations. But there have been non-public situations where people have said derogatory and bigoted things and racist things about Hispanics or natives or even black people around me because they assumed that I was white like them. And I've even had people, when I did speak up, Go, well, why do you care? Well, I care that you're making horrible statements about 
Mexicans because I am one. And they're like, what? <laughs> can, can I speak on that? Yeah. Um, when we first started dating, uh, I didn't realize how prejudiced my brother was towards Latinx people. And he came over to the house one day and said this thing. And I looked over at him and I said, excuse me? And, and I called him out on it because I was clearly dating somebody who was Latinx and indigenous. And I didn't want my family thrown around insulting words because it affected me emotionally. And you certainly didn't want them doing that if I was around. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I was like priming them. It's like, you say anything like that when Des comes around, uh-uh, <laughs> uh-uh. Well, they shouldn't say anything like that, period. But with family, you sometimes have to take baby steps. My passing privilege means that a lot of people don't equate us as interracial, as I said before. We don't necessarily encounter a lot of day-to-day -day racism because it's not obvious at a glance to a lot of people that we are in fact different. And certainly in the climate that we are in now in this post-George Floyd racial awareness, there's a lot of focus on race as being black or white when really there are a lot of other people of color and racial minority groups that also have to deal with things. Different things, not necessarily as severe things. Certainly if you have passing privilege, you're not as afraid. There are a lot of times when I'm afraid if I see a cop car or I'm afraid of dealing with the government for anything. And that all goes back to my upbringing and my race and the not being a real American or whatever that is. I, I do remember in junior high, this very, very white boy who I was working with in the library uh, making some comment and I'm like, dude, my grandmother was born in Topeka, Kansas. My grandmother, was your grandmother born in this country? <laughs> or are you a second or first generation from immigrants? Because just because you're white doesn't mean you've been here as long, let alone how many hundreds or thousands of years my indigenous family, uh, both in Arizona and Texas, have been here before this was America. I grew up in Tempe, Arizona, and I grew up a couple miles uh, north of Guadalupe, which was the Yaqui, uh, community uh, that had moved north and settled there so that they could um, so that they could be farm workers year-round and make money when Des and I got together uh, they told me that's where their relatives were their, their ancestors were from we lived there during the time of Sheriff Joe Arpaio and I came home from work one night I opened I barely got the door open and it was, do you know what he's done now? And I was like, okay, we're having a conversation. And I shut the door, shed my jacket and was like, let's go. Cause it wasn't just a matter of profiling Latinx people. They, he was actively targeting indigenous people, even though he knew they weren't Latinx. Yeah. And he was targeting them in very, like, we are going to camp out outside of church when they're having their first communion. In Guadalupe. And scare them from going to church and scare them from doing anything. That was like the double hit of he's profiling not only Mexicans, but he's profiling my actual Yaqui tribe. Yeah. And that, and that was big. That was huge. That was the first time, one of the... One of the few times that I realized in this relationship that it's a thing. That being indigenous and being, being Latinx is a thing. And that I had to be open to hearing you and seeing you when you had these fears come up, when you had these pressures that you felt, 
when the news was reporting these kinds of horrible things all over the valley, I, ha I was there supporting you in whatever you needed to speak at the time. Right. And when I had to have the, oh my God, I have to carry my birth certificate with me. And other people were like, but, but you pass. And I'm like, the people who are profiling know what they're looking for. The average person on the street may not be aware. They may just look at skin color, but the ones who are doing the profiling, they look at facial features and hair color and eye color and everything else. They know how to profile. And we lived in a part of the country where they weren't profiling blacks, they were pro profiling Hispanics and indigenous. One of the things that Johnny pointed out to me that racism in this country, location matters. So a lot of times in Phoenix, I may have been dealing with my internal fears and some of them maybe not so internal, but people were still not necessarily clocking us as an interracial couple and we weren't encountering problems for being an interracial couple. Then we moved to Santa Fe. New Mexico. Santa Fe, New Mexico where there are centuries of conflict between the Hispanos people who came from Spain and colonized the area and the indigenous tribes who had been there for thousands of years and they know who's Hispanic, they know who's indigenous, they can see who's white just by looking at you because that is just part of the fabric of society there. We hadn't even been living there very long, right? And what happened? No, it was when we before we moved before there. Before we moved there, we were thinking about moving. We there. went to we were visiting, and we we went down to the plaza, and all the people had their um, wares out on their blankets. Indian market. People had their their turquoises and 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 their necklaces and their jewelry and all sorts of stuff, and we were walking, and this one guy looked at us and his eyes followed me until we couldn't see him anymore and i'm sure they were like burning holes in my back and it wasn't that he wasn't looking at des he was looking at me and then the feeling coming was how could des be with the colonizer with the colonizer they were getting clocked as a traitor because they're with a white person and that was the first time it happened. After we moved there, it happened several more times. It was, it was an interesting thing to deal with for me because I hadn't dealt with that kind of racism before. I'd only dealt with, well, you're, you're with a black person, how could you? How could you, the indigenous person, be with, th with the this, with the stealer of lands? Something I grew up with being told by members of my family that when you grow up, you're gonna marry a good Mexican man and give me little Mexican great grandbabies and whatever, and you have to keep the bloodline pure and, and don't go with none of those white people. Don't go with any of those black people. You have to stay Mexican. And because I experienced a lot of, I heard those messages over and over and over again growing up, there was actually some trepidation, not just in coming with a same-sex partner, but to come home with a white person. And there are some members of my family that do give me side eyes for having a white person with me. They also give me side eyes for being queer, but that's a whole nother that's, story. Yeah. What happened last year, this is before COVID happened, I was called on to go help take care of uh, Abuela. So I had to go take care of Grandma. My uncle, who usually takes care of my grandmother, needed to go away for the weekend. I go to take care of Grandma, and after it's all said and done, Uncle comes back to me and says, you've really won her over. And I'm like, what? Grandma really likes you. I actually, because I went and I cared for her and I was there and I listened or we talked and, and made sure she had her medicine and had her food. She just decided that 
I'm, you were okay. I'm okay. I'm 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 a good person. To go back to the whole, are people giving us side eye because we're queer? Oh, that is actually part of our everyday experience. That here we are in Kansas. We've lived in Phoenix. We lived in Santa Fe. We visited various parts of the country on our road trips, and. We stop in tiny little towns to, you know, get gas or go to the bathroom or whatever, and we see people, and we see people at rest stops, and they look at us. Are they giving us that side eye because of gender, because of sexuality, or because they've spotted the racial difference? And a lot of times we don't know which or which combination of it is. It is depending on our location, right? Depending on our location, but. For most of the time, because I have this passing privilege, I assume it's because we're queer, not because we're interracial. And sometimes Johnny's the one who's pointed out, no, it's because of the race thing. Yeah, yeah, the, the few times it's happened that way. I, it's usually a bathroom issue. The, the race, I think, we don't encounter as many problems as a lot of other people because I pass or because they're distracted by the queerness to yeah. not notice the, the race. Are they queer? Are they trans? Are they, are they interracial? The flip the yes. coin. <laughs> We're all three. I'm still processing through my own forms of racism that have been ingrained in me against black people, against people from other parts of the world, against the, the colorism that's ingrained in me. And Johnny's still processing his own white privilege, his own fragility, you said. Well, it's, um, what's the word? Guilt? No. Oh yeah, lots of white guilt. White guilt, white guilt. Uh, we'll be talking, Des is, Des is going through this thing about being indigenous, and so they'll say some things, and I'll be like, now I feel this big. And not because of them, but because they're saying something that I already feel guilty about being a Caucasian. And it's... Um, again, it's, 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 it's giving, giving our relationship that space for us to, to look at different angles of ourselves and not intrude on that process. And so I'm like, you know, okay, you got to go through this. You got to, you know, we're going through this and I have to handle myself accordingly and, you know, not dump on them and, and, and checking myself, making sure that I'm not saying things that are hurtful, harmful, or in any way going to make them think they have to stop. I mean, I already have this, I have my own fears. Obviously, since we're going through a heightened awareness of race in this country and a heightened awareness of inequality, it's not something that's new to either of us. This process of me reclaiming my indigenous heritage, which was actually separated from me for most of my life. That has been going on, I would say, for at least six or 10 years, but more intensely for like the last four or five that I've been doing more digging within myself as to how I feel and what the issues are and how it has affected my life without my realizing it. And definitely how it affects other people's lives far more critically than it does mine. But this process isn't going to abruptly end. It's something that we're gonna be dealing with the, the rest of our lives together. And hopefully there'll be some continuing progress made not just with us but with the rest of the outside world the world outside our relationship that's that <laughs> there's way. this whole vast thing outside of ourselves as far as me the only thing i've got to say is um 
I love this human being and we have gone through a lot together and we'll go through more and I'm not I'm not going anywhere anytime soon and I love you I love you too and if you have any questions for us or about, comments or comments about how race and ethnicity has played in our relationship or your own experiences that you want to share please put them in the comments below if we get enough questions we might do a follow-up video we'd love to do a follow-up video leave us yes. questions or comments thanks for watching yeah thank you so much we'll see you next time take the opportunity right now to hit that subscribe button